May 5th, Peacekeepers Ransack Caravan, by Murrow. By the time I arrived at the caravan, the farmers had already buried their dead friend. The grieving farmers told me that peacekeepers had blocked their path and demanded to inspect their loads. When one farmer, more proud than wise, objected to the unjust treatment, he was failed by a fatal blow to the head. The rest of the farmers could only stand by helplessly as the peacekeepers ransacked their goods, moving on after they'd taken what they wanted. Tragedies like the one I witnessed are becoming increasingly common on the country lanes and caravan trails of Tyria if one is to believe the tales I've heard around campfires and from travellers. There's only so much common folk can take, one farmer said, repacking his load. I've half a mind to join the Shining Blade myself. This last sentence was delivered in a cautious whisper. The balance of power may be shifting in Kreiser, but open talk of treason invites a visit from the Inquisitors. All right, we're we back online here. I think we are. Hi guys, and welcome to another video. Welcome back to the War in Crisis. So, uh, we long time no see. We've had uh, two weeks off uh, over Christmas and New Year. I hope you guys had a great Christmas and New Year. Um, I, I know I took the two weeks off. I could have, in theory, really kept doing War in Crisis through that. I hold my hands up, but I just, you know, over Christmas I tend to stay up really late, and then I, basically for a while there I was up all night and not up during the day, and I don't like doing videos at night because everybody's asleep in my house. Blah 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 blah. In any case, we're back at the War in Crisis. We've got the Winter's Day stuff going on. I hope you guys had a good Christmas. I already said that in the uh, the Winter's Day series, but there you have it again. In case you guys, some of you guys haven't been watching that one. Um, and yeah, so we're back to the Warring Cry. This is actually <laughs> this is post commentary here because uh, this first video I've come back to after Christmas, starting the new year, getting back into the Let's Play, and um, I had a massive power cut halfway through the the video. I swear to God. So I lost all of the commentary for the start of, of the quest that we're about to do. So uh, what you're listening to right now, originally I was reading all this dialogue out. What we're doing here, we're at the Shining Blade Camp. Um, and we're trying to find this last bit of dialogue. There's one last little bit of dialogue left to see and I thought I'd have to keep zoning in and out. This was my first attempt and as you can see we've actually already seen this dialogue. Uh, so what I do here is I'm going to cut it until I get to the right one, which was actually the second zone, which isn't too bad. Um, so we'll cut it until we get to the, the the actual new dialogue and then we can start the episode properly and I'll just sort of read all this. Hopefully I can abandon the quest and then I can just retake it and it'll be like nothing ever happened. It'll be brilliant like magic. So yeah, I'll, hold on one second, I'll cut it. Here we go. So uh, Thackeray says the white mantle have amassed forces in multiple places. Hold on, I need to full screen this so I can actually see what he's saying. Uh, Divinity Coast, Watchtower Coast, and the Temple of the Unseen. They are expanding their presence within the Peacekeepers and increasing their interrogations, looking for Shining Blade sympathisers. Actually, says that I, th I think he actually says that uh, as a reply to something Langmar just said to him, but I missed it where I had to quickly start filming. Bartholo says, "How the hell do you know all of this, Thackeray?" Yeah, you see Langmar. She says, uh, "What news from the front, Kieran?" So he replies by saying, "I walked up and asked." one of the inquisitors and Bartholo says wait what you, you just walked up and did what he says I just asked him he had the information and I wanted it so uh, the, the main reason I wanted to show this one this last one which potentially could have taken a while loads of zoning to get Bartholo says that actually worked that's the last bit of dialogue the reason why I wanted to show you this one was because actually it's it's like quite funny it's the funniest one that actually appears of all the dialogues it's probably my favorite one that actually appears here back at the camp and like they, they don't expand on that at all it's just oh so there you go Thackeray just went up and asked the white mantle and they gave him all of their plans which is pretty cool so yeah now what I did in the original film in this video I went over to Lion's Arch to get the next bit of quest uh, we're not going to see the Shining Blade camp for a little while by the way because that's all the dialogue's done. There is one more later on when some of the bigger sort of more sweeping changes in the Warring Cry happen. Uh, we'll come back here and I'll show you like this other dialogue thing but it's, it's quite different to what we've already seen so what I'm going to do is go back to Lion's Arch, we'll start live commentary again and see how this goes. I'll see you guys in a sec. Um, Riverside, oh I can abandon it, brilliant, okay so it'll be like nothing ever happened, right ignore the fact that we're a Sanctum Key there. Uh, we can come to Lion's Arch. That's so annoying. It happened for so long and the, the power cut was for such a stupid reason as well. We have to top up our power like manually basically. It's kind of like pay as you go power. And uh, my little brother had like put us onto emergency the other day and so we kind of assumed we still had some it, it was just so so stupid. We got an electrician out and he was like yeah you guys aren't paid up so it was just quite embarrassing for my mum but there you go. So we're going to go back into the Lion's Arch Keep and enter the game. I was so excited about doing this video as well because I got up super early today. Like my body clock's all back. It's all good and nice. I got up at like eight o'clock. I'm prepared. I've got some cool ideas for some series I want to do. Like, you know, that was New Year. I've got these different plans and stuff that I wanted to start like writing out today. But uh, man, it's so late in the day now. I don't know how long it's going, how long I'm really going to have to be able to dedicate to that. But anyway, so now that we've done those first three kind of quest things, you know how I talked about how this kind of goes in phases. Uh, now we get three more quests and they, they happen in order from Princess Sama. She'll give us the 
the first one. So the first one is called Riverside Assassination, and it goes like this. According to our agent, she says, the vile Massart, Willem the Demeaning, arrived in Riverside Province and has barricaded himself in the Temple of the Unseen. So the Temple of the Unseen was actually just mentioned in the dialogue at the start of this episode. It actually worked out quite nicely like this. The Temple of the Unseen, if you remember in the Prophecies Let's Play, was actually a really important place to the White Mantle, like super important. That's where the Chosen were supposedly going, but instead they were being sacrificed. It was just like this really holy important place to the White Mantle. But since that one mission in Prophecies, you don't really see or hear anything about it. So I think it was really good of Arena Net because they actually decided to reintegrate it into the story, and it's pretty damn cool. Um, and of course, yes, we have a, a, a Messiah here. We've got the first Messiah entering the fray in the Warring Crater. So. Here's how the Massart really work in the Warring Crater. It, it feels really weird playing through the Warring Crater in comparison to Prophecies. Like, if after watching this or playing this, you go back and play Prophecies, it's really weird because, like, you'll just be slaughtering your way through hundreds and hundreds of Massart in those later missions. But it, actually, in the Warring Crater, it's nothing like that. You get just a few Massart, and they're treated as extremely powerful agents of the White Mantle, you know, in, in control of the White Mantle. And basically, they have this massive effect on the battle, and every single one, it sort of serves as this huge challenge and roadblock. And in fact, there are a lot of kind of quest mission things, and they're based around the few Massart that are actually taking place in the One Cry, which is really cool. Because, I mean, obviously, we know the lore, the Massart were mostly wiped out, so it makes sense that there aren't that many Massart around anymore, but instead they're like these super powerful things because of this weird kind of story that they don't explicitly say. But, like I said, about how we, we don't seem to be infused anymore, at least the common people of Kryta and the Shining Blade definitely aren't infused. So, you can just imagine how powerful the Massart really are. So, uh, boatloads of mantle forces have arrived in the area over the past few days which suggests that they're planning something. Our men are tired and battered and the mere sight of the mantle's unholy false gods frightens our less valorous soldiers to the point of desertion. Yes, that's quite a cool point as well, I like that they added that in there, because really if you think about it, a lot of the Shining Blade are really, they're just farmers, they're just average people from Kryta, you know, they're not warriors, so I I must admit, if I was actually in the war in Kryta and I heard that there were white, that there were actual Massart around, I would probably desert as well, I wouldn't want a part of it. I need a small force to infiltrate the temple and assassinate Willem before he can lead his forces into battle. We have an operative in Sanctum K named Paulina, she can get you into the province and has information on the temple's defences. If you undertake this challenge, it will be fraught with danger. Do not accept it lightly. The Massart are formidable foes, and Willem is sure to be heavily guarded. Okay, so there we go. That's the plot. I am prepared to do this. Willem's days of terrorising the Crichton people are numbered. You want me to march into a cult temple and pick a fight with their god? Count me out. No, we're gonna do it. Okay, so we'll go over to Sanctum K. So this is how this works. Just before our, our little break, I did mention this in the previous video. Um, that the way Warring Crichton now works is it actually takes you into explorable areas that used to be parts of missions, which in Prophecies wasn't something that ever happened. So we'll speak to Blade Operative Paulina. May the gods Wee, and the dialogue you. actually, this is exactly where the power car happened last time. So um, this woman actually, she is the woman who used to give us information about this specific mission, the Sanctum K mission, um, but now you can speak to her for a different purpose. I mean, how cool is that? So you can click her actually how can I help? and you can like speak to her about all this different crap about the orb, uh, about about the vizier and about awe and stuff because this is sort of when we were going to meet him to give him the scepter of awe which of course we now know in retrospect was a massive mistake so this was actually a really pivotal part of the story this was like this is the point where the vizier everything fell into place for the vizier and he put, put, and he manipulated us and we gave him the scepter it's a really really important part of the story so but this is the kind of the stuff you can speak to her about but at the same time Welcome, you can speak to her about a topic that takes place eight years later so, so she says i'm not going to read this dialogue because it's not actually relevant to right now so I'm going to instead click, take me to Riverside Province. And she says, so, you're the happy volunteers, eh? Well, we best get moving if we're to arrive under the cover of night. Our boat would like to be as discreet as possible. It's a short trip, so I'll just brief you on the other side. Oh, are you ready to go? Oh, now let me get my rations. I'd hate to have a grumbly tummy while sneaking around. Apparently this decline, um... This decline dialogue here, this is apparently reference to Metal Gear Solid, like apparently one of the games, I've never played the series, but apparently one of the mechanics is if you get hungry then it can alert guards or something, that sounds pretty cool, but apparently that's a reference to that. So let's do this. So what you'll find that I, I really like also that Paulina tells you about it having to be night and she's saying, so basically they designed this mission to be an infiltration mission and we're going back to Riverside Province, the explorable area, but as we know, or you may remember, when this was a mission, this was also an infiltration mission, remember? We were sneaking through to get the Scepter of Awe from the Temple of the Unseen, so obviously they didn't have the resources to change this whole explorable area from night to day, so they just decided to write in a plot where this was another infiltration. How cool is that? So we're actually going to be re-infiltrating the Temple of the Unseen, it's pretty sweet. So uh, we can speak to Blade Operative Paulina. 
You honor me. And she says, Our spies have been monitoring the mantle's patrols around the temple. They have noticed the forces are much lighter towards the back, where there's a door that leads directly into the heart of the temple. Unfortunately, the door is kept locked and requires two keys to open. Van the Conservator and Degas the Cynical each hold one of these keys. It's a bit of a trek to reach them as they're both beyond the temple on the west side of the province. Our other option is to run to the front door, sword swinging and wands are blazing. Just to keep in mind, there are significantly more forces at the front of the temple. So you get a choice with this mission as well, it's always nice to have a choice. Um, as with most choices like this in Guild Wars, however, uh, it's pretty one-sided. If we press U, we can actually see uh, uh, on the mini-map you get some actual icons. So here's who we need to kill. You kill Willem the Demeaning, you win the match. Here's the gate lock. So you can sneak in and essentially fight less, or supposedly fight less by sneaking in. But to sneak in, you're going to need the keys to the gate, right? But, and to do that, you need to fight your way all the way across the explorable area over there. And that adds about 40, 20 to 40, I shit you not, 20 to 40 minutes to the entire mission to go all the way over to those keys. So, as I said, it's a bit one-sided. Most people just recommend, hey, just, just storm the front. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be fighting a hell of a lot more peacekeepers and white mantle by going all the way over to the keys than you are if you just storm the front. I guess the difference is, with one method, you have to be a more powerful team that can actually survive um, a much larger assault because there's going to be more enemies at once there. Or you're going to have to be a bit more careful with the pulling. Or you can sort of have a much slower approach where you're fighting smaller groups the whole way. But I don't know whether that's necessarily true anyway, because there's so many choke points here on this map where you can then accidentally just aggro way too many White Mantle anyway. So, you know what, I, I would certainly recommend, I don't think I've ever tried to go for the keys but I've heard the horror stories so I would certainly recommend going for this guy it's not too difficult as you can see here we are being hit by spectral agony and shit I'm not actually infused maybe we should be see this is weird as well it makes out in the story like you're not supposed to be infused anymore um, and I suppose if you're playing with heroes, in case you don't know, heroes are automatically infused, so that's not going to be a problem. But, I don't know, maybe I should just infuse my new armour. By the way, yes, this is our Winter's Day hat. Um, obviously, that episode of the Winter's Day series isn't out yet, but it's pretty cool. I've got a few Winter's Day hats. I'll be wearing this one for now, because the other hats actually clip with your armour. I won't reveal what the other ones are. Well, hopefully, you'll probably see them in my inventory. I'm not going to remember to not open my inventory constantly. So, you might see them, but that, you know, it's a minor spoiler for, uh, the, the, for the Winter's Day stuff. Anyway, what exactly am I doing? Why am I just standing here? I may as well fight these guys. What you get here is, you may remember actually in Prophecies, I talked about them quite a lot. They must start have their towers. They've got these tower things and they have people up there. Particularly in this mission, they were a big part of the mission. Because if you remember, this is what I described as the closest thing to a stealth mission that Guild Wars has to offer. And I, I still stand by that. Um, and that's because if you remember the actual, the, just to complete the mission on this, not the bonus, what you'd have to do is sneak through and you'd have to try and ignore these guard towers. The bonus flips that completely on its head and has you attack every single guard tower in this mission, if you remember. Um, which is like completely different. That's obviously, oh, did we do? No, we didn't do bonuses back in Prophecies, did we? So we actually got to do it stealthy. That's pretty cool. But that's what the bonus had you do. It had you take out all these top towers, and there's loads of them. Well, now that we're back here, um, you've got the towers again. But on top of the towers, what you tend to find are the Jade Cloaks. These are the new enemies that I talked about a few episodes ago. There was, uh, I think, was there one of them by each Inquisitor? I think there was. Uh, these are basically the Jade Armors that we saw in Prophecies, except they've got a new character model. And they have got a lot of defense. You can see this guy's just simply not dying. That's A, because I can't get to him. B, because because Mox can't get to him, and C, probably because Hader can't hit him, not that she does much damage, to be honest. So, he's just going to have ridiculous amounts of defense, even if you, even if us as melee could get to him, it would probably take us a while to kill him. So, what I'm going to do, since he's... Also, I, I should probably explain the mechanics of it as well. Those Jade things, they do inflict Spectral Agony. It's just it's not just Massart that will inflict Spectral Agony. They they have their constructs that they build. They, they give them the ability to inflict Spectral Agony as well. So what happens is, instead of having um, it as a spell, though, these constructs, instead of casting Spectral Ag Agony as a spell, what happens is, I think it's... I think it's critical hits, but it could be every single hit. Whenever one of these things actually manages to hit you with a physical attack... Oh no, he cast a spell. Oh yeah, okay, there's a difference. Okay, so there's two different types of constructs. One, you've got the, the bows, if you remember, the jade bows and the armors, the ones that hit you physically. Those guys, I think it's when they critical hit they just automatically inflict Spectral Agony on you, which is actually a lot more dangerous than the Massar because that's got no recharge. Um, but then you've also got the Caster ones as well, these guys, which do ridiculous amounts of AoE, might, might I add. You 
see that Savannah Heat there. That just does so much damage. Um, those guys will cast it as spells as well. Those are the new ones as well. The new ones are a spell casting construct, which is quite interesting as well because I remember in Prophecies, they had a lot of different constructs. So quite a few races had constructs because don't forget you had the Forgotten as well. And all of the constructs were from spell casting races that used them as sort of their brute force. Remember, don't forget that the Massar are described as a spell casting race and all of their constructs back then were all they were warriors and rangers, you know, they were the physical guys. Well, now during the war in Crita, they've actually developed constructs capable of casting magics. The implications of that has are just ridiculous. I mean, you could, could go into so much detail about that and about how the Massar are using magic before the, that comes from a time before the gods, which is maybe why they can do that while the other races don't seem to be able to do that because magic's always treated as kind of this thing that you need at least some level of intelligence to be able to perform, although that's not explicitly stated, so that could just be me. Um, just uh, making that assumption on mine. Oh, okay, so I'm in a churning earth. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, now that it's established that this was the other thing that I was thinking as we were coming into this mission. Um, obviously, my team seems to be doing okay. That When this first came out, I'm not sure if the whole war in Krite has been made easier. Specifically when it first came out, I can tell you, this was hard. I remember really struggling my way through this. Granted, I did basically say no fuck this i'm gonna use discord way the whole way through and a lot of the enemies here their builds are specifically designed to counter stuff like discord way so i probably uh, had a bit more trouble than i, I gave than i should have had 